Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Reason Through Podcast, a show dedicated to having charitable philosophical discussions, as well as helping you, the listener, develop and reason through your views. In this episode, I speak to Dr. Jason Rogers. We speak on a branch of philosophy known as epistemology. In short, epistemology is about how do we know what we know? What do we mean by knowledge? And can we actually have knowledge? So that these are all kind of the, the questions that we ask around uh, epistemology. This episode will be broken up into two parts. In the first part, we will be going over the historicity behind epistemology, as well as how it has been classically defined. Following that, we'll be talking about two modernistic approaches to epistemology, known as proper function theory and reliabilism. In part two, we'll be going over internalist theories of epistemology, known as foundationalism and coherentism, so be on the lookout for those. If you find value in this content, please consider subscribing, rating, reviewing the podcast as it shows your support, and I greatly appreciate it. Without further ado, I bring you Dr. Jason Rogers. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode. Today with with me, I have Dr. Jason Rogers. Uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks a lot for having me. It's good to be here. Yeah. So before we get started on our topic today, if you wouldn't mind telling our listeners who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah. So as you said, I'm Dr. Jason Rogers. Uh, Not a lot of people these days call me Dr. Rogers. Uh, I am no longer in academic philosophy formally. Um, I actually work as a software engineer, but I have my PhD in philosophy from the University of Rochester, uh, taught for a little while at George Mason University, uh, which is near where I'm located in Virginia. Uh, And yeah, um, I suppose that's about it. I've been working as a software engineer now for about uh, five years or so. Uh, since uh, moving on from uh, academia, uh, but still, of course, in into philosophy and into the game. So happy to talk about philosophy uh, today. Yeah, and that's kind of like an interesting shift, right? Because it's like philosophy and then software engineering, yeah. which is yeah, like totally <laughs> unrelated. I mean, I guess to some degree they might be related, but uh, yeah, the, interesting. So how did you fall into that? Um, so, yeah. I guess, so two questions. How did you fall into software engineering? And what got you into philosophy to begin with? Okay, great questions. Yeah, so I was always into both uh, since high school. Um, So, and there is overlap. Uh, The main overlap is logic, of course. Uh, So when you're programming, you are writing a lot of conditional statements and things like that. Uh, So in philosophy, you're also thinking logically. um, And there's more to it than that as well. Philosophy helps me to clarify my thoughts, to um, be precise. Um, and that is definitely needed in software engineering as well. So the overlap is there. Um, and yeah, like I was saying, I was kind of into both. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know if I'm old right now, but I'm in my late thirties. Uh, so I was around when the internet came out and that really excited me. Um, I found a lot of cool stuff. I found about philosophy, uh, a lot of things that I probably wouldn't have found otherwise. And I also got into computers at that point. So I've uh, been doing both ever since, paid my way through grad school by also working as a software engineer, because um, uh, grad school doesn't pay you that much in philosophy. And um, yeah, so I've always loved both. Um, software engineering just happened to give me the option to more easily live where I wanted at the time. Uh, the job market was a lot better, things like that. So um, I still pursue both, but uh, my occupation right now is software engineer. And I'd love to talk more about that at some point you know um yeah philosophy can be used for a lot of things and that's just one example so yeah and that's definitely something that's i mean definitely needed in general right is kind of like thinking through um kind of conclusions about things so like when you're designing yeah. software programs right like okay well is this you know you have to some sense reason through right no pun intended but like you know like uh go yep. through that process and to see if this is going to be i don't know uh accurate i guess or so i i'm not familiar with software engineering so uh, but I can yeah, see yeah. the relation between the two. Right. And you, you actually made me think of a thing that you just mentioned too, is uh, one of the things we'll be doing today when we talk through some of the epistemology stuff that we're going to discuss in a bit is uh, we'll do this sort of method in philosophy where you consider a, a proposition and then you try to come up with counterexamples to it. Thinking in that way is also really valuable in software engineering. You think about edge cases, uh, things that they might not have anticipated, but that could happen. Uh, so actually quite a bit of overlap really uh, in the sort of model of thinking that you employ. So so kind of uh, piggybacking on what, uh, a little bit into kind of our preempting our discussion a little bit. So in philosophy, you kind of fell more towards the ep- uh, epistemological side because there's different branches of philosophy. There's uh, moral philosophy, metaphysics, 
you know, uh, free will. Uh, yep. And so, uh, but you kind of fell towards epistemology. Is that something that you just kind of in grad school or just kind of in your academic process, you're like, you know what, I really like thinking about epistemology and kind of uh, developing one or just, you know, I like how I like to think about why people believe what they believe, whatever the case, um, as opposed to kind of the other branches. So how did, right. yeah, how did that fall for you? Yeah, good question. So for me, uh, when I got into philosophy, it was pretty young. Like I said, I kind of found it in high school and started reading things that no high schooler usually reads. Uh, but uh, what really interested me the most was thinking about what I should believe and what I should do. Okay, so uh, my area of focus in grad school was epistemology. My secondary area of specialization was ethics. Uh, so uh, both of those questions were sort of the main ones that I was interested in. And um, I guess I sort of thought, well, before I can know what I should do, I have to know what I should believe about what I should do. So epistemology wins <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but, or, or maybe it was just my intrinsic interest. I'm really interested in it too. So that's how I definitely. got into that. Yeah. Very cool. And it's definitely important, right? Because no one really sits there and thinks about like, well, how do I know what I know? Uh, or why do I believe this? And should I believe this? And what are the kind of the ethical virtues of belief uh, to some degree? Yeah, especially right now where there's, you know, people say fake news now and things like that, right? So there, there are these new terms uh, going around in the social media sphere and things like that, uh, where, you know, critical thinking is really important. So um, yeah. hopefully something I can say today might be interesting in that regard. Um, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Uh, and so I think this is a great segue into our topic, which is uh, epistemology, which is kind of uh, the branch of philosophy dealing with how do we know what we know? Um, and you know, what is knowledge and kind of dealing with those kind of meta questions a little bit. Yeah. So uh, Jason, if you want to kind of uh, describe to us kind of the history behind it a little bit, and then we can move on to uh, further discussion. Yeah, so um, I'll kind of be talking a little bit about like some very ancient history and then pretty much jumping to very recent history. So there'll be a big gap there. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can start uh, just by thinking about the word epistemology. So uh, if people are wondering why it's called that, uh, I mean, it's the, the way it's understood today is essentially theory of knowledge or thinking about what knowledge really is at its core, like you said. That's because, well, it's not because, but it related to that fact is the name of the subject, which is epistemology. Episteme is knowledge in Greek. And then logos is a word for something like the principle or uh, reason or discovering the components of. So, um, loosely, it, it directly translates almost into theory of knowledge. Uh, and like you were saying, it has a long history. So it goes back all the way to Socrates, uh, at least, um, probably people before him that I don't know much about, but uh, uh, you know, some of the pre-Socratics that they thought about questions related to theory of knowledge. But uh, the sort of most classical, I think, example of epistemology in uh, Socrates is the Platonic dialogue Theotetus. So in that dialogue, um, they're doing roughly what uh, a lot of recent philosophers have been doing as well, which is something like trying to come up with a view about what knowledge is. Um, uh, you might call it an analysis of knowledge, uh, roughly trying to find what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for you to know something. Uh, so necessary and sufficient, that just means like what things are required and what are the things that if you have them, you've got knowledge. Uh, those are the su sufficient conditions. So uh, in that dialogue, um, Socrates is asking that question of Theotetus and they're uh, using this method that I mentioned earlier of uh, considering a proposition and then trying to come up with counterexamples to it. So I won't get into all the details of that dialogue, but Theotetus proposes a number of ideas about what knowledge is. Socrates says, well, that doesn't seem like it could be knowledge because think about this and this and this. Uh, Theotetus says, oh, I guess you're right. Here's another try. Uh, and um, what happens in the end of that dialogue is they don't solve it. They, they don't resolve the question. They end in what's called aporia. Um, aporia maybe is the correct pronunciation. Um, but um, yeah, so, and uh, some people might tell you we're still in that state today, uh, not quite knowing what knowledge is, but there are some views and I'll be discussing some of them with you here today. Um, 
Yeah, and so, that's, yeah. A, and that's something kind of, that's been kind of turned into, at least, right, is a kind of the Socratic method, which is, so you have, if, so in some, some type of dialogue, presumably like something like you and I, right, where you might be expressing some type of proposition, and I might be taking kind of the Socrates route or the Socra uh, kind of using the Socratic, Socratic method to be like, okay, well, why do you think that? Well, what does that mean? Uh, how do you know what that means? Uh, how does that relate to what you're talking about in the real world? Uh, and so that's how I, I kind of interpret it. At least what goes on my brain was like, okay, this is like the beginnings, right? Of like the Socratic method in some sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's right. And e even in this dialogue, they they proceed sort of the, the way we're going to try to proceed today. So um, one thing they start with, or at least Theotetus uh, tries to start with is by uh, giving some examples of knowledge, right? And it's probably helpful for us to think of a few. So, I mean, some obvious ones uh, that, you know, standardly you might think you know, right? Are things like uh, one plus one equals two. Uh, I'm hungry. Uh, I'm actually not hungry right now, but uh, <laughs> I'm not hungry. I know that, uh, right? Uh, this is not the first day of my life, um, which might sound weird, but of course, if you've, I don't know, thought about the fact that your memory could be made up in some way, you might think, well, maybe it is, uh, but uh, things like that. Um, and more common things too. Uh, a is the first letter of the alphabet. It's not raining outside my house right now. Um, things like that. And then there are also things you don't know, right? Um, so uh, the number of the stars in the universe is even. Uh, I have no idea. Um, I don't think anyone knows that. Uh, so we can go through those and kind of think about um, what features do the things I know have to sort of figure out maybe what's necessary and sufficient for knowledge. Likewise, the class of things I don't know, well, what is it that makes the case that I don't know them? That'll help us try to get towards some kind of idea about what knowledge is. That's what epistemology really is all about. Although a, a caveat that'll come later is we'll start talking a lot about this thing called justification, which is not exactly knowledge. So epistemology's name is probably not fully disclosing what it is, but uh, without saying too much further, that's about how your work so yeah, yeah. so um, we can kind of go in I think and move into kind of the traditional analysis of what knowledge is yeah uh, yeah yeah great so so and <laughs> I keep mentioning Theotetus uh, he kind of tracks a little bit of this discussion too in that dialogue so I mean when you think about the cases I just mentioned uh, some things are obvious uh, about them right so uh, if I think um, this is not the first day of my life what does it mean that I know that? Well, I believe it. Okay, that's that's one thing. So it seems like maybe belief is required for knowledge, right? The other example I gave of what I don't know, the number of stars in the universe is even. I don't believe that because, frankly, I don't think my evidence supports it one way or the other. But uh, the fact that I don't believe it seems important. So maybe belief is an important part of what it takes to know something. Uh, that seems plausible enough. Uh, likewise, um, it's true that today is not the first day of my life. Um, it's true that one plus one is two. It's true that it's not raining outside my house. Uh, you might think about a false proposition, uh, like, I don't know, Julius Caesar was the first president of the United States. I don't know that. Uh, even if I believed it, though, I wouldn't know that one, because that one's false, right? So it seems like truth is probably in some way important to knowledge too. So it has to be a true belief. Uh, so you might think, all right, that's enough. And in fact, um, just a historical note, there, there is a recent philosopher who defended the view in the 90s, I think it was, that knowledge is true belief. Most people don't think that. Um, I think in the, in the Socratic dialogue, I mentioned Theotetus proposes that at one point. Um, but someone would have to check me on that. I, I, I don't remember for sure. Um, but it seems like that's not enough, right? So we can think about examples there too. Um, let's see, uh, suppose I was a baseball player, right? Um, I used to play baseball when I was a kid, um, but some people play it professionally now. Uh, the best batting average that any baseball player has ever had was below 500. That means less than 50% of the time they get a hit, right? But probably these baseball players have confidence each time that they go up to bat that they will get a hit. Uh, so they probably believe it. Uh, it probably helps them do well. And sometimes that's true. 
uh, you might think though, they don't really know that they're going to get a hit. Uh, most of the time they don't, in fact. So their evidence, if they were really thinking just with a goal of believing truly, they might think, eh, you know, I'm probably not gonna get a hit. <laughs> uh, they probably don't know that they're going to get a hit at least. So something there, more than true belief is involved. It's something like having good reasons, uh, support of some kind or something like that. Um, and other examples make the case even easier. Um, it, I don't think I can control my beliefs entirely, but if I could make myself believe, I don't know. Uh, suppose it is true that the number of stars in the universe is even, and I just believe that right now. Uh, I don't know it still. I'm missing that other thing, uh, support for that belief, a reason for that belief. And in that Socratic dialogue, one of the things Theotetus proposes, I think it's Theotetus who proposes this, is um, knowledge is true belief with an account, uh, something like a, an account of why uh, the belief is true. Uh, they get into other details what the account might mean, but um, that sort of idea was embraced roughly since Theotetus Seemingly, at least, uh, everything I say here is going to be controversial. Someone will dispute it. Uh, but roughly, you could say that people essentially had something like that idea for most of the history of epistemology, at least since epistemology has been its own branch, so to speak, of philosophy, that knowledge is true belief with support or something like that. And the word that we ended up using was justification. So people would say knowledge is justified true belief. That's the traditional account of knowledge that you just mentioned. Um, so yeah, that seems like uh, if for, for listeners who have never encountered epistemology or philosophy, um, what I just did with you is kind of walk through um, the basic methodology we use. So it's considering examples, um, wondering if a certain proposition is true or not, testing it by thinking about cases and seeing which view accommodates the case is best. Uh, and it was thought for a while there that justified true belief basically got the cases right. Okay, so um, just to jump in and to kind of recap everything. So yeah. what, when we're traditionally or historically, when we talk about what makes, what gives not, what gives someone knowledge, we're saying that they're not only does someone have to believe that something is the case. So kind of going back to like your batting your batter, right? Someone he believes, or this person believes, uh, they're going to hit the ball. Um, but they also need some type of justification for why they believe they're going to hit the ball. And yep. not only do they need the justification, it needs to be true that they're going to hit the ball. Mm -hmm. And so all those three things are kind of required. So once we have um, those three things, that is sufficient enough to say that this batter uh, has knowledge, but they're all different cases, right? So like going back to your batter average, or uh, going back to the batter, and uh, mm -hmm right? Well, just because the person may believe and the person has a justification, it doesn't seem to follow that they kind of know that they're going to hit the ball. Like, you know, how can you know something that's prior to something like that? Yeah, uh, good. I, I was going to say a future knowledge case might be a little tricky because people will get hung up on things like that. That's, that's true. Um, I think what, what people would be inclined to say there is, well, maybe you need really strong evidence and yeah, the batter couldn't quite get that in the circumstances he's in, given that he knows, you know, every now and then I miss and it's not an insignificant portion of the time. Yeah. There might be some things in the future uh, you could know. I knew I was going to talk to you uh, mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, now you might think, there are reasons you might think I didn't, but mm -hmm. at least pre-theoretically, it seems like you could know some future things. But yeah, th what you were saying is eff effectively correct that the, the account that we called the traditional account says it, roughly there are these three things. It's gotta be true, you gotta believe it, you gotta have a reason for believing it. And you, you, I thought maybe you were gonna get on one other thing. You have to believe it for the reason uh, is typically another thought here. So you can't just have good reasons but not be thinking about them and they have nothing to do with why you believe as you do. Um, you have to believe for those reasons. Um, that's a thing that some, if, if your listeners ever encounter philosophy, people call that doxastic justification, belief that's based on your justification. Doxa just means belief. So, so kind of like um, something really mundane, right? If I, 
uh, have a, you know, a can right here. Well, let me see, put it in the mirror and I drop mm -hmm. it, right? So prior to, um, you know, in the past, right? Every time I drop something, you know, gravity kind of has a force and it pulls it down, right? And as a result of that force, that's the reason for my belief. I just don't have something that's pre, uh, I guess, uh, I don't even know how you would even say something like that, where something that's pre something, or um, I wouldn't believe in gravity before it's ask, before it's actually happened, I guess, or if I didn't have evidence to warrant that belief or sufficient for that belief. Uh, yeah, right. If you did, that would be weird. You wouldn't yeah. be someone who knew about the effects of gravity. Without um, it, or it's either experiencing or yeah, in some way. So. Yeah. Now, now, as we'll see as we talk a little further, there are different views about what it means to have justification uh, for believing as you do. But yeah, that's basically the the rough idea. So then, I get this is perfect, right? So we're we're so traditionally, right? You have the the three kind of criteria that we've kind of laid out here, and mm -hmm. then now we're moving into kind of uh, some funky cases, right? Known as the Gettier problems, uh, that <laughs> kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, destroyed <laughs> justify true belief and yeah. kind of shook, uh, shook, shook, um, kind of epistemology in some way uh, from this one little paper. Uh, you want to touch upon that? Uh, some Gettier cases and sure. kind of how that. I guess once once that happened, how that now has affected epistemology and um, what that what that means kind of going forward. So kind of modernistic uh, versions. Okay. Yeah. Before I do that, also, I want to touch on something you, you were bringing up before that maybe some listeners might be worrying about, too. Um, some people have the view that the kind of justification you need for knowledge might have to be enough to like make you absolutely certain that there couldn't be a possibility you're wrong. So in the examples we were considering, maybe they wouldn't count those as knowledge. What I was trying to do and what we'll try to do here is kind of think pre-theoretically, what are some cases that we do think are cases of knowledge? And then maybe if something causes us to later revise that you to think like we need to be absolutely certain we can do that but even those people would require justification they just require very strong so i did want to address that real quick but yeah so stepping back uh, to the, to the, to what you were mentioning gettier this guy gettier um yeah so he wrote this very small paper uh in the 1960s uh everyone who remarks on it sort of remarks on how short it is because of the impact it had it, it as you said it it kind of um I mean, shook it up is probably the right way of looking at it. So Gettier uh, was thinking, uh, he was noticing that, you know, everyone was kind of saying roughly that knowledge is justified true belief. So his paper is titled, Is Knowledge Justified True Belief? Uh, and his answer is no. Uh, so the thinking that we just did to try to come up with that view, um, he's going to try to give counter examples against it. And these are called Gettier cases. Um, so your listeners who are familiar with recent epistemology have probably heard that word, uh, get, or that name, I mean, Gettier, they might've heard the, uh, what is it? Uh, the adjective Gettierized, <laughs> uh, that's when you're in a Gettier case. Um, these are cases where it seems like the person has justified true belief, but still doesn't know the proposition in question. So, uh, here again, we're using this methodology where we consider cases, test the hypothesis, namely that knowledge is justified true belief against those cases to see if it's either falsified by them or not. And yeah, I can just jump into a case. Uh, so some of these are kind of funny to think about. Uh, they're a little strange, but you have to just stick to what exactly is described in the case. And uh, Gettier uses the name Smith and Jones uh, for each of them. Uh, some people like to use more colorful names at times, but uh, so he, the first one he presents is this case, this case of uh, someone having 10 coins in their pocket. So it goes something like this. So uh, Smith is a person, and Smith is the one who's going to have a belief that we have to question, does he know it or not? So, uh, so Smith is applying for a job. And uh, uh, while he's at the place where he's applying, he somehow gets very strong evidence that this other guy who's applying, Jones, is the one who's going to get the job. So um, so he gets strong evidence that Jones is going to get the job. Maybe the guy who interviewed him outright tells him, like, hey, thanks for coming. We'll still do the interview. But listen, Jones is getting the job. Uh, you're not. Um, sorry about that. Uh, maybe Jones is really happy looking and it's like on the phone with his wife or something like that, saying, I just got the job. They gave me the offer, uh, things like that. So he's got really strong evidence that J Jones is getting the job. And for whatever reason, Gettier doesn't say exactly how. Smith comes to know this, but Smith also knows that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. 
So I don't know, maybe Jones is a coin collector or something like that. And before they interviewed, he was showing Smith, look, I've got these 10 coins in my pocket. There are these amazing coins or something like that. So Smith believes, oh, well, the, the guy who's getting this job has 10 coins in his pocket. So that's true, just suppose in this example. Uh, and Smith believes it. And he's got some good reasons for believing it. It seems like he's justified in believing the guy who gets the job uh, has 10 coins in his pocket. Turns out that the guy who's getting the job is Smith himself. He had misleading evidence. And he didn't realize it, but he had 10 coins in his pocket. <laughs> so he had a justified true belief that the person getting the job has 10 coins in his pocket. But it seems like he didn't know that because he thought it was Jones who had the 10 coins and was getting the job. It's actually Smith. So something went wrong there is the thought. Uh, the thought is there's something more required than just justified true belief. Uh, so that's one example. I'll stop there if you want to talk about it, but there are others as well. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes one case works better for people than another one. Yeah. Uh, so we'll do a couple. So kind of just highlighting a couple of things that are within the scenario. In in the um in this kind of thought experiment, there are two people, Smith and Jones. Um, Jones has the um, justification and the belief. Component. Smith has it. Smith. Smith has mm -hmm. the justification and the belief that this is going to happen. Uh, but it turns out that <clears throat> that's not actually the case. So what Gettier is trying to, I think, get at, right, is that you can have a case where someone is totally justified. And not only are they justified, they believe it as a result of the justification. But it turns out that they're actually wrong, right? They're not, he's not wrong. He has a true belief, remember, that, that we okay. need to have a case where all three of the conditions are met, but it's not sufficient for knowledge. Okay, I so, see. So the true belief, though, is the man who's getting the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Yes. Right. So the, the key point, though, is that Smith is the man, <laughs> and Smith didn't know yeah. that, right? So seemingly, for something like those reasons, Smith didn't know that the man who has 10 coins in his pocket Actually, the one it's the one job. Get the job. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's like, okay. Ahead. Maybe, no, that, that's my misunderstanding because I've always interpreted kind of at least this case with Gettier where you have someone that actually believe, not only believe, but have the justification. But uh, he does so, have both of those. Yeah. But there wasn't sufficient enough to give, I guess the way I interpreted it was like, well, because he was wrong, uh, you can have yeah, the he, belief and justification, but that's not sufficient enough to give you the knowledge uh, of something that was going to happen, I guess. Um, yeah, but he was wrong in the sense that the reason he formed the belief that uh, the man with 10 coins in his pocket uh, will get the job. That was true. Yes, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so the thing you're picking up on is actually the thing that a lot of people picked up on when they read this paper and wanted to respond to it. Uh, so I'll talk about some views like that in a, in a minute. I did want to give a couple other cases just in case it helps people. Um, yeah, go for it. Okay, so the Gettier gives two. He gives that one, and then he gives another one about this guy named Brown. Um, so there's still there's still Smith, uh, and there's still Jones, uh, but there's now this other guy Brown as well. So uh, Smith works at an office with Jones now. So they're in a different context. They're not interviewing for a job. They're just coworkers or something like that. And um, uh, Smith gets a ton of great evidence that Jones owns a Ford. Uh, Maybe Jones, he sees Jones driving to the office every day in a Ford. Uh, Jones tosses his keys on his desk every day and it says Ford right on them. Uh, maybe Jones always talks about Ford ownership, uh, really loves Fords, um, talks about having to take it to the shop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so jo uh, Jones th then realizes, Jones, Jones su suppose has been, I'm sorry, not Jones, Smith. Smith realizes uh, okay, Jones owns a Ford. Well, I've been studying logic for a bit, and I've learned that if a proposition is true, then the disjunction of that proposition with another one is true. So in other words, if it's true that Jones owns a Ford, then it's also true that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. Uh, because what makes an or statement true is just that one of the disjuncts is true. As long as one of them is, the or is true, right? Um, so he can infer validly from Jones owns a Ford to Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. 
Uh, so he says something like, well, I like to have true beliefs a lot. I'm kind of building in some flavor to the Gettier example. Gettier doesn't say all this, but for whatever reason, Joe, uh, Smith comes to believe, I'm going to believe that one too, because it, it follows from what I already believe. So, hmm, uh, Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. Now, again, unbeknownst to Smith, Jones has been faking it with the Ford the whole time. Uh, who knows why, but uh, he's actually just been renting this Ford for a very long time or something like that. He doesn't own it. Uh, and also unbeknownst to Smith though, Brown is in Barcelona, <laughs> just by coincidence and not related to the, the other facts at all. So the thing that he believed, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona, is still true because Brown is in Barcelona. And again, the either or, just you just need one of them to be true. So he, and he believed that, uh, he believed it. So we got truth and belief. And he believed it for good reasons, because he had seen Jones driving the Ford every day. Jones was talking about owning a Ford. Jones showed him his keys, everything like that. And he inferred from that something that guarantees the truth of the later belief. It entails it, uh, that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. So he had a justified true belief. But again, it, he wasn't, he didn't have knowledge, the thought is, because seemingly or at least this is one hypothesis about what goes wrong. The thing he believed, either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona, he believed it because he believed Jones owns a Ford. And he was wrong about that. So he just got lucky in some sense that the thing he also inferred uh, was true and something he had reason to believe. But he doesn't know it. And that's the other case. Um, and there's a modification of it. I'll just jump into that real quick because some people don't like the fact that it uses this inference rule, this disjunction rule that you can uh, add a disjunct. So, and just to kind of clarify, a disjunct, right, is something yeah. like, uh, like you said, is kind of e either or. So, for right. example, like um, I'm either drinking uh, a beer or I'm having water. Well, I'm not having water. I'm not drinking water. I'm drinking a beer. Therefore, yeah. I'm drinking beer. so that's that's like a very mundane, very trivial kind of disjunctive kind of syllogism mm -hmm. uh, that leads you to that kind of conclusion. And that was right. going on within this case right now. Yeah, and some people get tripped on up, tripped up on it because they hear the either or and they think, well, Brown's being in Barcelona is in no way related to Jones owning a Ford. So how could he be justified in believing either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona? That's because we're building stuff into the or mm -hmm. that is not technically uh, there when, Bra when Smith, sorry, does the inference from Jones owns a Ford to the disjunction. He's doing what's um, strictly entailed by his belief. Yeah. Uh, if, it's, if it's true that Jones owns a Ford, then it's also true that either Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona because for the latter to be true, it's sufficient that one of the disjuncts is true and he thinks Jones owns a Ford. So. But because people get tripped on that, I, I did want to give another example that's similar. Uh, we can call the two people no got and have it, okay? Uh, so Smith is in an office with a guy named no got. For, forget the name if it bothers you, but uh, no got fakes that he owns a Ford. Uh, but Smith doesn't know this. So he's just like Jones in the previous case, right? Uh, and so uh, he sees no guy driving in a, to work in a Ford every day, uh, jingling his Ford keys, talking about how great it is to own a Ford. He loves Fords, yada, yada, yada. Maybe he'll get a second Ford. All this misleading evidence. So Smith believes, okay, no God owns a Ford. And then he infers, instead of inferring a disjunction, he infers, well, if no God owns a Ford, then someone in my office owns a Ford. That one you can maybe see more clearly. It follows definitely from the previous one because they're coworkers, right? So no God owns a Ford. So someone in my office owns a Ford. Turns out no God was faking, but there's this other guy in the office that Smith has never met <laughs> named Havit, right? And Havit does own a Ford. So it is true that there's someone in my office who owns a Ford. And, and uh, Smith believed that. And he believed it for good reason. He had all that evidence about no God owning a Ford and inferred what followed from that. But he didn't know. That's the thought. He didn't know that someone in his office owns a Ford. He, um, his reasons were in some way defective and he just got lucky, something like that. So maybe that helps a little more. Yeah, and that's totally, I'm, I think that's a little bit more clarifying for mm -hmm. whoever might be listening. So as a result of kind of these Gettier cases that we kind of been highlighting, um, how does that then, you know, uh, I feel like 
I'm not quite sure on the history of epistemology, but that seems to like, you know, having those cases would kind of like we stated earlier would shake a little bit kind of what we mean by what we know. Uh, right. so, like how has philosophers kind of grappled with this? Uh, so if you kind of want to touch upon uh, other ways um, that we kind of, uh, philosophers have kind of dealt with right. these post gettier problems. Yeah. Yeah. So if listeners are wondering, like, why are we even talking about this Gettier guy or, or why are we getting into these weird cases? Uh, well, this is kind of stage setting for maybe the last, what now, 70 years of epistemology. A lot of it has focused on trying to figure out exactly what knowledge is in a way that um, gets these cases right. Uh, so it says that in these cases, yeah, the person didn't know, even though they had justified true belief, there was some other condition. So this, will, this is a sort of a way of introducing your um, listeners to the context. So, uh, and by the way, some people, there are a few people still who think maybe we should just say knowledge is justified true belief and handle these cases in some other way. But mostly uh, the response has been, ah, yeah, it's not justified true belief. There's something else required. And so actually one of the first responses to Gettier really early on, uh, and it's one you sort of hinted at when you were um, saying that Smith was wrong you, you were focusing on the fact that the thing he believed that he then inferred the true thing from was itself wrong. And that is one view that people uh, try to defend in response to Gettier's paper. But as we'll see, probably the whole, the last, like I said, 70 years or so of epistemology has not totally, but in a lot of cases, uh, been devoted to trying to come up with a view, and we'll talk about a few of the or more popular ones uh, in response to Gettier. So, the, so the first one that we'll talk about is this view that knowledge is justified true belief with no false grounds. Okay, so that is none of the grounds on which the belief was based are false. So you were noting that Smith was wrong about the grounds, right? He he believed in the case, say, of the ten coins he believed that Jones was getting the job. And because he believed that, he believed, and also because he believed Jones had 10 coins in his pocket, he believed the man who's getting the job had 10 coins in his pocket. But it was false that Jones is getting the job, and that's what went wrong. Seems pretty good, right? Seems to get the case correct. Same thing in the uh, Brown is in Barcelona case. Uh, Smith believed Jones owns a Ford. So Jones owns a Ford or Brown is in Barcelona. Uh, he turned. It turned out he had a justified true belief, but the reason he believed it was that he believed Jones owns a Ford, and that's false. So again, he had a false ground. Go to the no God have it case. Uh, he believed no God owns a Ford, therefore someone in my office owns a Ford. But the basis that no God owns a Ford, false again. Okay, so uh, you might think that uh, the fact that there were false grounds uh, in the justification for the belief uh, is what is also part of the story about what makes something knowledge or not. So you need to have all true grounds for it to be knowledge. Some people still take that view today. Um, it might not be the most popular. Um, a couple, so we'll go back to the sort of thing we were doing at the beginning, talking about this method of counterexample, right? Where we say what's necessary and sufficient for knowledge and test it against cases. Uh, people thought, mm, that's not quite right, okay? So, um, because if you think about the no-got-have-it case again, there are what are called alternate routes, okay? Different ways that um, Smith could have come to have the justified true belief that don't involve false grounds but still seem like they're not knowledge. Okay, so this will be a case uh, that's supposed to show um, justified true belief with no false grounds is not sufficient for knowledge, right? So the case goes like this. Suppose instead of inferring, uh, suppose instead of believing no God owns a Ford, therefore someone in my office owns a Ford, Smith believes like this instead. Uh, he looks at no God and he thinks, someone in my office owns a Ford, okay? He, he doesn't form any belief prior to that, okay? Or maybe, maybe if he does have to form a belief, he believes something like, Someone in my office appears to own a Ford, appears very strongly to own a Ford, acts like he has Ford keys, uh, uh, seems to drive into the office in a Ford every day. Therefore, someone in my office owns a Ford. 
those grounds could all be true, right? It could be true that there is someone in his office who acts like he owns a Ford. Have it, ha have it might be the one doing that, uh, who drives in the Ford every day. Again, have it does that, so that's true too. And so when he infers someone in my office owns a Ford, he inferred it on the basis of true propositions, okay? So he didn't have to go through a false belief that no God owns a Ford. Instead, he went, he was more careful or something like that. He said, someone in my office appears to own a Ford and has Ford keys and drives a Ford every day. So someone in my office owns a Ford. No false ground there. That's the thought, at least. Uh, there are other cases as well. So you might have cases where um, you believe something for multiple lines of reasoning, and some of them have falsehoods in them, uh, but some of them don't. So you actually do know but you had some false grounds, that would be to show that it's not necessary to have no false grounds to know, but I, I don't want to muddy the waters too much. Um, but so that, that sort of view is, um, I would say it's probably not tremendously popular today, um, though there are still some defenders of it. So people, people started thinking more um, about what was required for being justified in the first place, for having justification. Um, so in the original cases, uh, we thought something like, well, uh, Smith had a justified true belief because he had good reasons in support of that belief. You might plausibly think, um, maybe, maybe that's not quite right. Maybe justification, he actually didn't have it, or, or maybe he did have it, but uh, the reason he didn't have knowledge is related in some way to that. Um, so you might start focusing on the justification condition itself and wondering whether perhaps analyzing it in some way would either help with Gettier cases or it might just be independently interesting too. You might think, well, knowledge is this really special kind of justified true belief or something. Really what I want to know though is what makes my beliefs even justified in the first place. Okay, That's kind of where what you mentioned, reliabilism comes in. Uh, proper functionalism is a little more murky because Alvin Plantinga is the sort of father of this view, uh, and he presented it as a view about what he called warrant, which is for him what turns true belief into knowledge. So he wasn't, you might make the case that proper functionalism wasn't just about justification, it was about something else, but some people do take the view that proper functionalism is the right view about justification. Uh, there's a philosopher named Michael Bergman uh, who develops a view roughly along those lines. So yeah, so we can talk about that some. Uh, so let's think here about how to sort of move most clearly from the Gettier cases to that. Um, so one thing that, let me just kind of- Yeah, so one yeah, thing yeah, great. I, so post Gettier, mm -hmm. from my understanding, from my reading, what happened is that we ended up focusing kind of what you touched upon a little bit, focusing on the relationship between belief, belief here and justification, and what's mm -hmm. the relationship between these two things. Yeah. Uh, that's where it seems a lot of more epistemology has gone through to where yeah. now it's like, okay, well, what makes a belief even justified in the first place, which yes. kind of leads into kind of this reliabilism or this proper function theory, which is uh, something we haven't really touched upon mm -hmm. as far as like an externalist theory of knowledge. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you kind of want to move into that kind of category and sure you know, spell that out. Yeah. yeah, so so maybe some of your listeners have heard the term externalist, internalist, or something like that. Or maybe if they haven't, they're wondering what the heck is he talking about that you just mentioned. Yeah, so uh, reliabilism and proper functionalism are two types of views that are sometimes called externalist views about justification. And you're right, they're, they're focused on the justification condition there. Um, and... Um, uh, historically, at least, there was some connection to the Gettier cases. Uh, a person named Alvin Goldman was the most prominent sort of reliabilist, still probably is. Uh, and he also had a theory about what goes wrong in the Gettier cases. Um, so there was probably some historical relationship there between the Gettier cases and reliabilism itself. But um, getting down to the, sort of the specifics, reliabilism is this view uh, that it, it, it's motivated, you could say, some by cases. Um, where you think, just like we were thinking about knowledge, you think about cases where something is justified. Uh, well, what are, what are some paradigmatic cases where you think you've got a justified belief? Well, you might think, for example, when I look around, 
and there's good lighting and uh, I'm focused, I'm not inebriated or something like that. Uh, perception is a source of justification, right? Uh, when I see the screen in front of me, I've got some reason to believe there's a screen there. So now, even if I don't know, you might think you don't really know you could for various reasons. We're now focused on just the justification part. Do you have any justification for it? Any, any, um, anything that makes it sort of uh, within your rights to believe? Uh, so I'm trying to say it in a non-biased way. I, I don't want to say reasons now because for reasons it'll become clear. Reliabilists think, um, at least in some cases, it's not really having evidence that matters. It's something else that matters to justification. So if you compare the good cases like perception that I mentioned, um, I don't know, memory seems to be a source of justification. Um, other things though don't, like wishful thinking is not a source of justification. Guessing is not a way to get justified beliefs. Uh, so if you think about those cases, you might think, well, what's really important there is that the process you used to form your belief is a reliable one. That's why it's called reliableism. So something uh, like, um, like kind of honing in a little bit like on memory, right? So in the past, my memory has been reliable about X or P, whatever, yeah. whatever proposition. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, when I'm recalling some type of information about P, uh, some proposition, uh, I'm justified in believing that because in the past, my memory has been reliable. Uh, yeah. And that's that justification. Yeah. And now it isn't even, it's not the thought that you rehearse the reasons you just went through. So it's not the claim that you know your memory was reliable. And so you believe as you do because you know that it was and so forth. It's rather just the claim memory is reliable, or if memory is reliable, then memory beliefs are, on the whole at least, or something like that, justified. Um, so that's, that's the non-philosopher in me. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so the reason it's called an externalist view is sort of for the thing I just touched on. It doesn't require you to know that memory is reliable. What matters here is not a factor that's internal to your mind, something you know or you're conscious of. Uh, it's instead something that's external, right? That's why it's called externalist. Uh, so it could be true that perception is reliable. That's why it gives me justified beliefs. Now, I happen to know that perception is reliable, I think, uh, but uh, that's not required. So like my son, who maybe you guys heard, I don't know if he was <laughs> loud enough, but he believes, you know, that his a uh, toy is with him right now or something like that. Uh, he's justified in believing that, not because he knows perception is reliable, and he's never thought about that, but because perception is reliable, something roughly along those lines. Now I'm being a little crude here. Yeah. Philosoph mm -hmm. phil philosophers who are listening might quibble with how precise I'm being, but to, to put it a little more precisely, the idea is something like the justification of a belief for a person is a function of how reliable the belief forming process that you employed is in that case. You can kind of you can kind of think of it like kind of a little bit like evolutionary perspective, right? So something like eye perception or something like um, like evolutionary or uh, natural selection has kind of endowed us with like a, a certain type of visual perception that if it wasn't reliable, then we wouldn't have survived. Uh, it was reliable because we survived and kind of kind of inference in that way. Therefore, like when I see something like if a car is coming um, because of evolutionary or natural selection, um, uh, that's the justification for why I believe that there's a car in front of me or something like that. Yeah, that might at least explain why your perception is reliable and tends to get at truth most of the time or something like that. You might think. Um, that, but that's kind of hinting out like when, what we're talking about, like and that's an externalist view. It's not me, the, the individual. Um, you know, like formulating inferences uh, based off of certain beliefs. I'm relying on something that has been, that's outside of, that's external of me uh, and in the sense kind of passed down in that way. Yeah, and it's a nice view because it handles some, if we're, again, using this method where we consider examples, it handles cases that you might think are tough uh, for other views. So um, I mentioned my son. I mean, it it's easy for him to, easy is maybe a biased way of putting it, but it explains, reliableism would explain, if true, why he has justified beliefs about the world around him. It's because his perception is reliable and he's using that, that type of belief forming process informing his beliefs. 
Um, it's not that he has done philosophy and thought very hard, like, is my perception reliable? Could I be being deceived right now or something like that? It, it doesn't require that much intellectual um, engagement is the thought. So the thought is like reliabilism is a view that's friendly to at least sort of the common or pre-theoretical ideas about what beliefs are justified and which aren't. All right. So yeah, if you want to jump in on kind of proper functionalism and see how that relates to uh, an externalist view, because uh, you said that kind of um, um, Alvin Plantinga kind of, um, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, champion this kind of position yeah. mm -hmm. um, and see how that relates to justification. Right. So, so I mentioned reliabilism, said some reasons why you might think it's plausible, but there's this other view. So it can't be the case that everyone thinks reliabilism is just obviously the case, and they don't. That's right. So um, you can think about an objection to reliabilism, at least the simple reliabilism that I described, that might motivate moving in sort of the proper functionalist way. So uh, one objection to, again, at least like a simple reliabilism of the sort I described involves thinking about uh, these cases of uh, a brain in a vat. Um, so if your listeners have encountered like Descartes or um, he, he had the evil demon who was deceiving you, um, right? It's something like the matrix scenario uh, for people who are less familiar with these philosophical examples. The thought is um, consider a subject who is unbeknownst to them, like Neo in the matrix before he realized that the matrix is like a thing, right? Or he's just a brain in a vat uh, somewhere being given all these false experiences and so forth. What people want to say when they consider that case is intuitively, well, Neo had false beliefs, but he had justified beliefs before he had any idea that he was in the matrix. He, he had a good reason to think like there was a computer in front of him. He, right, good reason kind of muddies the waters a bit because reliableists aren't relying on that, but he had justification for his beliefs that uh, he was sitting at his computer, that he worked at an office building. Um, and similarly, a brain in a vat even if he is being deceived, he's getting all these sensory experiences and so forth. Seems like he is justified in believing, he or she is justified in believing uh, whatever is you know, appearing to them is real or something like that. Uh, so people want to respect that intuition. And the thought is that simple reliabilism at least can't. Because if you think about it, that brain in the vat or Neo in the matrix, his beliefs were massively false. He was not using a reliable belief forming process. It was always resulting in true beliefs. So yeah, what they what they meant by reliable, I should have said this earlier, is a process that uh, produces mostly true beliefs. So it seems like the simple reliableist at least will have to say, uh, no, the people in the who are brains and vats in, this, in these cases, or Neo in the matrix, were not justified in believing what they did. And that seems wrong. So people thought, uh, reliableism gets the case wrong there. We gotta do something else. So proper functionalism, is in some ways related to reliabilism. It's an externalist view, but it handles reliability a little bit differently. I said earlier that sometimes it's apl applied to this idea of warrant. I'll be talking about it as though it's a view applied to justification, roughly in the way that the philosopher Michael Bergman I mentioned uh, does. So the idea here first is one of like, um, you could think about your cognitive faculties and whether or not they're functioning properly, right? We have some idea about what it means for an organ to function properly, like a heart, right? Uh, your heart's functioning properly if it's uh, beating at a certain rhythm, pumping blood through the body. If it starts beating all over the place, you know, crazy and stuff like that, it's not quite functioning properly. If it stops, it's not functioning properly, right? So we've got this pre-theoretic notion. Uh, maybe we can use it in epistemology. Okay, so the idea there is something like, uh, and again, I'm going to be a little bit crude because we can't get into all the details in time, but uh, a belief is justified for a subject uh, if and only if it is the result of the operation of uh, properly functioning cognitive faculties, right? Okay, with some additional stuff. So these cognitive faculties have to be ones that are aimed at producing true belief. Uh, they can't just be like uh, aimed at something else like you having fun or something. So if, you're, if your truth aimed cognitive pr uh, uh, processes are functioning properly, they produce the belief and they're reliable in the environment for which they were designed, 
uh, then your belief is justified. So I'll say it again, because I kind of, there, there are a lot of conditions there. The idea is roughly a belief is justified for a subject if and only if it's the result of truth aimed cognitive processes that are functioning or cognitive faculties that are functioning properly and are reliable in the environment for which they're designed. So that last part, reliable in the environment for which they're designed is important to addressing the brain in a vat example or the matrix example. The proper functionalist will say, uh, you're right, the, the subject who's a brain in the vat, he has justified beliefs, uh, even though they're wrong. Neo had justified beliefs because the beliefs were produced by a properly functioning cognitive faculty that's aimed at the truth and is reliable in the environment for which it was designed, the real world. Uh, even though it's not reliable in that environment, that wasn't the environment that it was designed for, right? So uh, the thought is anyway. So that's how you address uh, the brain in a vat case. Um, it's still an externalist view, right? Because again, it doesn't require the subject to have any awareness of the fact that his cognitive faculties are functioning properly uh, or, or true thing or anything like that. So the thought is proper functionalism can get you the benefits of reliabilism because it allows like um, less sophisticated subjects to have justified beliefs. Uh, so it gets the common sense cases right. Um, and avoids the objection from the brain of the vat and neo and things like that. I was going over Feldman's book about some of the objections. Yeah, one Rich of, Rich Feldman. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of them that I had, or at least one of them I think he lays out when uh, uh, to proper function is that, so he, he uses the example of someone that's colorblind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so someone that's colorblind uh, sees, uh, and I have friends like this, uh, but they're presumably seeing a color that's either not there or a different shade. Uh, but they're nonetheless still justified in believing um, what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to kind of be in conflict, I guess, or is there a, con a tension between the justification and belief there? Um, yeah, if you have anything to kind of say about that. Um, yeah, so so the case is something, is, is one where, I just wanna make sure we have all the details right. So the person is colorblind, um, so, I guess your thought is it does not have properly functioning visual faculties or something like that uh, and comes to believe. So what exactly something that's not true or that what's ex what exactly is the target belief you have in mind? Like that a red apple is gray or something like that. Yeah. So let's say someone that's colorblind that is, for whatever reason can't see the color red, but and they see a different and they see the apple and the apple is, I don't know, gray or something like that. Um, just a different shade of color. Proper function theory is saying that a person is only justified if their if their um, cognitive faculties are um, um, properly functioning, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Theory. But you have cases where you have someone that has a faculty, cognitive faculty, that's not properly functioning, but they're still nonetheless still justified in believing what they're experiencing. So yeah. proper function either has to be modified to some degree, or something ha something has gone kind of awry within that epistemology. Yeah, yeah, great. So yeah, you're using, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so good. You're, yeah, you're using the method uh, of counterexample that we talked about some. So, uh, that's a, supposed to be a case where uh, proper function is not necessary for justification. Uh, right. So, uh, I'm not, I'm not totally sure what Plantinga would say about that case. Um, it depends some on how you individuate cognitive faculties. So um, a, a response might say something like, well, his, this person's visual system is still functioning properly overall. Hmm. Maybe, maybe it gets color wrong or something like that, but it's still like detecting things in the environment. It's showing him what's really there, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you could say, I suppose, I'm trying to be a proper functionalist here. Um, about this case that um, the cognitive faculty in question, even though it doesn't get things right all the time, it has this glitch or something like that. Uh, it's still, the faculty is really this broader visual faculty and it's functioning properly. So that's the source of the justification in that case. Uh, so maybe proper functionalism can get around it. Maybe not. Uh, there may be a, a problem there. So um, 
I'm not a proper functionalist. Uh, I guess I'll give that away. Uh, so thinking as one about this case is a little tough. Um, let's see. But it's a good case to think about um, for sure. Uh, and I don't recall the objection, that, that particular part from Feldman. I don't know. Do you, do you have it in front of you? Uh, but he, he was actually saying something along what you're saying was that- it called... Let's see if I can find it. Let me just read it a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. So proper function and good function. There is a difference between something functioning as it is as it was designed to function and it's functioning well. A poorly designed system might function as designed yet not function very well. This is most clearly seen when considering things that have been designed by conscious agents. Suppose some people have proposed a produced or underpowered a car that accelerates very slowly. They might say that on the one hand, the car is functioning as it is designed to do. There are no malfunctions. It is doing exactly what it's supposed to do, given the way it was designed. Yeah, that's a that that sounds to me like a slightly different objection. So the the objection there is something like proper function is not sufficient for justification, right? So it's a case where a thing functioning properly is still not functioning well, uh, right? So like a a car that just it was designed a certain way and it is functioning as it was designed, but it doesn't. It, it doesn't ultimately work very well. Uh, so that's like a case where, um, so you might think of, a, I think Feldman might give something like this example, right? So uh, a, a not quite so good designer of cognitive faculties, uh, or maybe he's reasonably good, but he just produces some weird faculties for some reason. Uh, he designs some faculty to, um, I think I think the example Feldman gives has to do with like primeness or something like that. Um, so he produces some fac faculty that um, whenever the person hears the word prime, he thinks, uh, he picks some random number and thinks it's not prime. Okay, so like, uh, I don't know, 42 is not prime. Mm -hmm. right? That's true belief. So um, that person could be properly functioning as he was designed. Uh, and the process could have been aimed at truth. So maybe whatever, we're just considering someone designing this, this cognitive system, a god or something like that, uh, who's not so great at designing, or maybe it's just, just has weird quirks. So he designs a system that makes you um, you know, think some number is not prime whenever you hear the word prime. And he does it because he wants you to have true beliefs. He knows, you know, most numbers aren't prime. So you will have mostly true beliefs when you use this faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's reliable in the environment as well. Um, but that's not good, seemingly. Seemingly the case is uh, one where the person is not justified, right? So you imagine someone who's just sitting around having dinner someone nearby says, I love prime rib. <laughs> and this person thinks 42 is not prime. <laughs> right? And he's right. It's the result of his, uh, his faculties functioning properly as they were designed uh, in their environment, but he's not functioning well. Mm -hmm. So uh, the thought there is something like, he's not believing rightly. You shouldn't just believe 42 is not prime when you hear someone say prime. Uh, he's not justified in that belief intuitively. So proper functionalism gets that case wrong. Um, I think that's the thought there. I don't know. Yeah, if that... and just kind of one final, I guess, word with from Feldman. Uh, yeah. he, write, he writes this. There is a difference between functioning as designed and functioning well. Proper mm -hmm. function theory makes use of the former notion in defining justification. If we focus only on well-designed beings, then functioning as designed and functioning well will coincide. But there's a being, but where a being is not well designed, where its proper function is not so good, the theory has the incorrect implication that it forms justified beliefs yeah, when right. it forms to this bad design. Yeah, the general exactly. reliability condition that is included in the theory does not solve this problem. Right. Yeah. So the, the prime example is one that's like that, where it's, it, the proper function is not well functioning still. Um, you could still also think there are problems from the from the brain in a vat example too. You might just think, really, does it matter? Is really what's going on here the fact that they're justified because 
they're using these cognitive faculties that were designed to be reliable in this other environment. I mean, you might think, why does that matter? Suppose, suppose the people who are brains and vats are in the matrix or whatever, uh, were actually designed to have false beliefs, to, to fail by the evil demon or something like that. Well, then you might think proper functionalism gives the view that they're not justified now because the beliefs are not resulting from faculties aimed at truth. Um, but that still seems like the wrong result. At least the intuitive thought is, it seems like no, regardless, they're justified in believing as they do. They have a, an experience as though they're in the real world walking around. So you might think for other reasons it gets cases wrong too. Um, not everyone agrees, of course. Yeah. Um, as the debate still uh, kind of goes on. Uh, uh, Mike Bergman has this book, Justification Without Awareness. Hmm. Um, he's defending a proper functionalist view about justification. So okay. check him out if you're interested. And that concludes part one of our episode on epistemology. Stay tuned for part two. See you next time.